and welcome to the latest video following the restoration of our two foot gauge Fowler locomotive Tully Sugar Mills number no. 5 works number no. 16341. Now this video is all about valve gear. Firstly the return crank which drives the eccentric rod which in turn drives the bottom of the expansion link. The expansion link rocks backwards and forwards having translated the round motion of the wheel into forwards and backwards motion of the valve and it pivots on the expansion link bracket which is there. Um, moving to the actual part, um, having cleaned these up from the locomotive, bead blasted them, primed them, um, they're interesting these in so much as one of this pair, this pair that was nearest to the camera here, is actually from our locomotive. This second pair is actually from the sister locomotive, Tully Sugar Number no. 2, which was works number 16339, and actually the locomotive from the original works photograph that you just saw me point to a moment ago. As we've seen before, it was routine at Tully Sugar Mill and, and the other sugar mills over Australia that loco parts would be switched around depending on what was ready to go at what time for each engine. Um, this is just skimming out the um, primer that's been put on by the shot blasters. It's really tough, but we needed to get to the actual metal surface to see what we were dealing with for um, skimming for new bushes. And here we're just cleaning the threads for the lubricator oil pots to go into, again with a tap. It's essentially just cleaning off that primer, which was rock hard really really good for, for smoothing the surface protecting the surface right onto the clean bare metal um, but a nightmare to try and get rid of this is the drawing this is a general arrangement this is actually the Bundaberg drawing rather than the Fowler drawing because we didn't have a Fowler drawing accurate and you can see there on the centre the bearing itself the thin double line around the centre of that shaft um, this is the new bearings being made so this is um, phosphor bronze um, being machined upon the lathe by Neil um, we're making that bearing to go into the expansion link bracket and hold the pivot pin for the center of the expansion link to rock in. Um, Neil there just using a, a, a dummy template that he's made to shove into the hole the right size for the pin on the expansion link just to check it fits beautifully in the hole and that's a couple of them already finished with a slight radius in there as per the drawing. We've done the same trick here that we did in the previous video where we've put the bronze, which you can see is slightly frosty colour, we've put the bronze in the freezer just to cool it and shrink it down a couple of thou just to fit in so it's easier to press in. As it warms up it expands but essentially it'll be a really tight grip in there. You can see here we're putting around about 10 tonnes on there just to push it down and flat and you can see that the motion bracket's been restored a little more here. It's painted black in its final coat and it had its base skimmed off so it'll lie flat on the surface of the, the actual motion bracket on the side of the locomotive. It probably wasn't necessary but we've put a little grub screw in there just as a keyway to stop it from spinning and you can see we've ground an oil cross pathway in there from the lubrication pot um, hole at the top. Looking at the drawings from the top you can see that there's one either side with the pivot line across for the top of the expansion link that you can see there. This is its sister engine. This is number two preserved or looking all oily so you can see how it goes and this is our engine before we started restoration um, before we took the parts off and cleaned them. Next on to the expansion link itself um, which obviously has to pivot on that bearing that we've just seen us make. Um, so this was um, actually two halves that were pinned together with three pressed pins right the way through and we ground the riveted overheads of these pins down here we're skimming up just to take away and there was tack welds as well so we're skimming up to take away the tack welds that you can see there to clean it so that we could get it in the press to press out the pins and separate the two halves quick look at the actual expansion link the slide ways either side take a die block that slides up on, on either side there and we'll have to split it apart so that we can machine those faces because there's no way to get inside there to machine it other than splitting it apart uh, so that we can get the, the milling machine in there and, and this is that process so there's a well, you saw it go there with quite a lot of force these really did take a lot of force because as you'll see later there's a countersunk kind of shape in the hole itself and the pin was riveted in and therefore had spread out and filled the countersink so short of really grinding down there we we just we just pressed them really hard until the countersunk um, riveting peeled off and they were able to push out 
With producing these videos, sometimes parts of the operation were filmed a long time ago. We, we actually pressed these pins out of the expansion links nearly two years ago now during COVID. Um, and as you can see uh, here, they've got filler on there to smooth out the, the rust surfaces on the primer. So you'll find things tend to jump around because I'm trying to tell a coherent narrative in the, the films themselves. Um, but here we go. That's them split apart. You can see that they've probably never been apart since manufacturing in 1924. Um, but really split apart now you can clearly see the ridge for the slideway where the die block would would slide up and down through that area there which will will make not in this video actually we'll make that in a, a future video this is the actual technical drawing of the fowler no this is the bundaberg expansion link and you can see the the pin there that's driven by the um, eccentric rod and um, this is me twisting the pin out there it's actually threaded in um, but the pin was rusted and gnarled and so it was just simpler on this one to to put a new pin in we did consider skimming it down and making undersized bushes um, but but it was a relatively small little disposable part so we we just decided that it was a, a more coherent solution just to make a new one Nice clean thread and a little bit hot there because it's obviously been work heated. Um, the pin and the new pin before it went in. Um, all sorted. So next stage was the expansion link. One of them was actually slightly bent when we looked at it. So this is, um, with the new pin fitted, this is heating up the slight bend just to create warmth in it so that we could just fractionally twist that back to being square again. Um, it wasn't very much, it was only uh, half a mil out, something like that, um, and it was just a little tweak while it was hot that allowed us just to bring the two faces back into square again, um, so that we were starting with a, a nice flat surface before we started machining it all on the milling machine. That's what's going on here. Once straightened up, the drawing shows again the two pins um, sticking out either side. Um, we had to skim them up on the milling machine to make sure that they were um, absolutely parallel with a nice surface on them um, to go into those bearings that you saw us make earlier. So this again is, um, is milling down, fly cutting down the surface. We did the horizontal surfaces as well that Neil's pointing to there on both around the pin and up at the top end for the um, the actual drive pin that you saw us make earlier. And then Neil here um, test assembling the whole thing so that you can see how the, the pin goes in the end of the eccentric rod um, and how the whole assembly sort of goes together. The last part that we have here is that the pin, the new pin that we made, actually has a little collar on the end and it will have a split pin through that to hold it. Um, didn't show you making that, but essentially we've done that same operation before in previous videos. I do. Now, the machining of the slideways in the expansion link was a little more tricky. As you can see, this drawing represents what we actually found in reality. There was a larger gap at the back than there was at the front of our expansion link, so they'd worn more toward the back. We took a decision as to whether to machine them symmetrically around the centre again or whether to just make new smooth surfaces and make an adjusted die block that was eccentric as well, that was larger at the back, um, to, to match what we had on the expansion links. And that's ultimately what we decided to do. So rather than repositioning the centre, we stuck with the centre of the worn expansion link and just made new smooth surfaces and later on we'll make a brand new die block to, to fit exactly what we had. That's the new surfaces. Again, we've skimmed them as lightly as possible to leave as much meat on, on there as we could. That surface doesn't matter so much because that's not the actual bearing surface, it's the fore and after that I ran my finger along first. So that was that done. This is um, one of the Bundaberg drawings. This is the, um, again, a, a view from the top and then the general arrangement from the side of the valve gear to show how everything comes together. And now we're going to move to the return crank, which is that item there. Um, it's got a square crank on the Bundaberg and it's actually a round pin on the Fowler. Um, just an alteration in the design as it was progressed by Bundaberg. And this is it looking from the back of the locomotive and you'll see again the return crank there which translates that round motion from the crank pin into the pin for the end of the eccentric rod. We turned the pin down and put on bearing shells as you've seen us do before because again that's a really good way of getting a very very accurate hard surface um, and that's the area 
area there that you've just seen looking as a plan view down on the top as it fits the eccentric rod. Again, those bearing shells work really well and, and have, have been a, a good solution for us in the past, so we've utilised them again here. We've made new bushes in that end of the eccentric rod, again with the crossed oil pathways and again with the grub screw pin up the bottom to stop it from rotating and keep the oil pathway in line with the hole in the top of the rod. Um, you can also see, you probably spotted a few times, that some of these rods have flat spots skimmed on them. Um, we've done that on all the rods. We'll clean it up and fill it later, but those flat spots, you can see it under Neil's hand there, allow us to clock them up absolutely flat on the milling machine so that we know that everything's square and in line. Um, again, they're a little bit unsightly at this point, but they'll get filled and, and painted afterwards. You'll never know they're there, but they've allowed us to be accurate with the machining. Again, a collar and a pin, no need to show the manufacturer of that again. So that's the whole assembly rigged up there on the bench. Lastly, there's holes in those um, uh, return cranks that a pin goes through, and the pin actually goes straight through the side of the pin itself. You can see it here. So the locking pin that allows it to tighten up impedes and intrudes onto the actual round crank pin itself. This is the crank pins being painted by Jenny and you can see when you look closely at the end that there's a little scalloped out part in the end of the crank pin. I'll zoom in on that um, now so that you can see it. Um, that scalloped out end fits in that pin, the pin fits into the scalped out end, and again it helps it to locate it in exactly the right position, it's almost a keyway. There is a keyway as well, but that helps to do the same thing. Um, so there we go, new bolts, new pins that we've put in there, so all of that assembly is now finished and, and ready to go back on the engine. Just lastly, a quick look at where it goes on the engine. Um, there you go. And, and again, thanks ever so much for watching, there'll be another video on uh, long shortly.